watching with our proceedings, please. Quiet, please. Quiet, please. I want dead silence before we begin, please. Marshals, marshals, please make sure that there is dead silence, quiet. No disturbance from any quarter, please. We want to start now. We're already 45 minutes behind schedule. Right, ladies and gentlemen, comrades, I would like to invite all of you to rise and to sing the national anthem, please. Try not to shake, please, Paul. As we all know, the national anthem should be sung with dignity, with power, with inspiration, because it is a prayer, because it is a challenge to us, but because it is a song of the people. <laughs> One, one, yeah, that's it. Ladies and gentlemen, comrades, workers, young people, members of the thank you, the mothers of the nation, professional people, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, we'd like to apologize for starting our deliberations 50 minutes behind schedule. I'm sure you'll appreciate the fact that if you are to register 4,500 500 persons, it is not always an easy task. Computers, useful as they are, sometimes do give in to pressure and sometimes they do give problems themselves. And we'll also appreciate the fact that 
with so many people coming from various parts of the country, representing all the major organizations in this country, that it is not always easy to register so many people. We have been forced to put up two more marquees in order to accommodate an extra 2,000 delegates so that they too can take part in the deliberations to the best of their ability. So I would like to inform the people inside this hall that there is still a lot of space in those two marquees that I referred to right at the back. So not everybody should try to squeeze into the privilege to welcome you to this historic conference. Take democracy seriously. People who support our struggle for the total liberation of all our people. Well, I'm going to invite the following speakers to address us. The first one will be Jerry Sal, followed by a speaker from the Norwegian delegation. And after which we we'll hear a few words from a speaker from the USSR. My God, this country is something like <laughs> that. Even a month ago, this would have been unheard of, but it is happening. And then the last speaker will be none other than Comrade Walter Sisuri. After that, they will make a few announcements. First of all, we would like to introduce Jerry Musala, I must confess it's a pleasure for me to do that because um, I've had the pleasure of taking part in workshops, consultations on theology at various times and places. And we have fought, not physically but intellectually, on several occasions. There have been vigorous exchanges between the two of us but they've all been very commonly, commonly exchanges, I can assure you, to remain very good friends. So I'm uh, inviting you to take the floor to address the conference and to say you very well. and exploited black masses 
and I can only speak for them and about them. Others will be spoken for by people who qualify to do so. Millions of oppressed black masses are worried with great anxiety. The news and the outcome of our deliberations at this conference today. At any rate, this is not a mass meeting. It is a conference. It is a serious conference. It is a conference about serious matters, a conference about matters of life and death for the oppressed black masses of our country. In that seminal text entitled Introduction to the Critique of Hegel's Philosophy of Right, Karl Marx makes the point which I think should be the starting point of our reflections at this very important conference today. He says, and I quote, history is thorough and goes through many phases when taking an old form to the grave. In the last stage of historical development is a comedy so that people should part with their past cheerfully. Since 1976, we have seen the thoroughness with which the historical actions of black students, black workers, black parents, black churches, black teachers, black communities, together with their local and international allies, have tried to drag apartheid to the grave. This conference cannot begin without first paying tribute to the supreme sacrifices that our people have paid many a times with their very lives. To them, we must say at the very beginning of this conference, Amanda.
that there is only one legitimate context for discussing the future of this country. The context is the history of the struggles of our people for national liberation. That context is the present state of the struggles of our people for national liberation. That context is the future of the struggles of our people for national liberation. The only way in which we can be co-diners at the table and not sit there with an empty plate is if we carry the struggles of our people into whatever is meant by the discussions on negotiations. Again, a small dose of the rhetorical eloquence and homespun honesty of Malcolm X on matters like this will do us good. He says to his comrades when he counsels them about the nature of the forces they are dealing with. He says, when you take your case to Washington, D.C., you are taking it to the criminal who is responsible for your problem. It is like running from the wolf to the fox. They are all in cahoots together. They all work with political chicanery and make you look like a chump before the eyes of the world. Here you are, walking around in America, getting ready to be drafted and sent abroad like a teen soldier. And when you get over there, people ask you, what are you fighting for? And you have to stick your tongue in your cheek. No, comrades, he says, do not take the case to the criminal. Take the criminal to court. I make bold to say, and I may be wrong, that the unity that is beginning to emerge among the organizations of the oppressed is undergirded by this hard-nosed political suspicion about those who are shouting negotiations from the other side of the divide. It is pleasing to find in the documents of all the organizations of the oppressed a commitment to struggle as the means of bringing about change and peace in this country. A clear message must go out from this conference that indicates to our people that the struggle is not about to be abandoned in favor of negotiations. That on the contrary, the struggles of the people, of the oppressed people, must be intensified in order to ensure that any possible negotiation is meaningful and does not represent a betrayal of the interests of the exploited classes of our country. Precisely because of the importance of, the con of continuing the struggle, the organizations of the oppressed and exploited people need to talk amongst one another. They need to talk about one another concerning the issue of negotiations. They need to, they need to talk about what it is that is being negotiated. They need to talk about how is it going to be negotiated? By whom is it going to be negotiated? And when is it going to be negotiated? We cannot start flirting with the opponents of our people before we have talked amongst ourselves and planned together and even acted together. The aim of the struggle is not to negotiate. The aim of the struggle is to eradicate apartheid and capitalism. Of course, it may become necessary to negotiate in order to achieve this goal of the struggle. But it is important to emphasize that negotiating does not automatically lead to the eradication of apartheid and capitalism. In fact, certain forms of negotiation may become a means of entrenching apartheid and capitalism. This conference for a democratic future must allow itself to be informed by as many perspectives of the organizations of the oppressed as possible. The African National Congress is, for example, correct in its view that the immediate aim is to create a just and democratic society that will sweep away the centuries-old legacy of colonial conquest and white domination and abolish all laws imposing racial oppression and discrimination. The structures and institutions of apartheid must be dismantled.
dismantled and replaced by democratic ones. Similarly, the black consciousness, black consciousness movement of Azania is correct in insisting that the nature of democratic structures that one installs determines whether or not the interest of the majority of people will indeed be taken care of. In fact, the fundamental question of whether or not there is a genuine liberation depends on what kind of democracy one establishes. Thus, the Azanian People's Organization, together with other organizations of the National Forum, necessarily insist on the struggle being a struggle for a democratic, anti-racist, anti-sexist, socialist Azania. Comrades here have asked me to apologize on their behalf. Let me just say to you that don't worry, there can be no normal mics in an abnormal country. <laughs> Comrades, I am also not aware of any organization of the oppressed that disagrees with the Pan-Africanist Congress on the importance of the land question. Landlessness as the basis of the oppression and exploitation of our people is an issue that undergirds all the perspectives of our, of our organizations. If we cannot restore access and control of the land to our people, we shall have negotiated their freedom away. The black people of this country will not be free until this land, their land, is free. All three of these perspectives, democracy, socialism, and land control, underline the importance of restoring the primacy of an independent working class organization which is free from bourgeois influences. It is true that a certain climate has to exist before any negotiations can take place. Political prisoners and detainees must be unconditionally released, and all restrictions must be removed from them. Restricted and proscribed persons and organizations must go free Troops must be driven out of the townships. The state of emergency must be ended and all apartheid and racist, racist security legislation must be eliminated. Political trials and executions must be halted. You will obviously have noticed that these are the OAU guidelines for a conducive climate for negotiations in South Africa. It is obvious to me that without these minimum conditions, any talk of negotiations should be regarded not only as lovable, but as a betrayal of the interests of our people. But comrades and friends, you and I know the nationalist government and their capitalist bosses, or have we forgotten? We have seen them design and impose a slave system of education on our people. We have seen them kill and murder in order to slam down the throats of black people and dehumanize the system of education. You have seen them possibly uproot the communities of 
black people and resettle them elsewhere using maximum brutality. You have seen them imprison and detain black political leaders and activists in order to deny them the political voice. What about the poverty, the ill health, and the starvation of our people that have been engineered by this government and their capitalist bosses? Have you seen what they did to our people through the Bantu stand system? What about all the murders that our people have had done on them during 1985 and 1986? Are we asking these same people to create a climate for negotiations? They put Mandela away for life. They locked up and restricted Sobukwe until he died. They bombed Unkoputi Tiro and killed Steve Vigo. They have only just been made to release them. We must not forget that, comrades, that they did not do it of their own accord. It was the pressure of the organizations and the movements of our people that made them eventually to release Jeff Masemula and Walter Sisulu. I think that we need a climate conducive for negotiations, but I do not think that FW declared and his crowd have the moral wherewithal to provide it. We cannot negotiate with them to negotiate with us. We must seize the initiative. We must locate the initiative in the struggles of the most oppressed and exploited classes of our society. What we need is a program of action that can bind together the forces of liberation in the country. Yes, we need a climate for negotiations, but we must create the climate for negotiations ourselves. The only way to do this is by intensifying the struggles of the oppressed people and classes at all levels of our society. We need a program of action whose aim will be to galvanize the oppressed, to struggle one, for the total transfer of political power from a racial minority to a national majority, who will struggle too for the reconquest and reorganization of access and control of the land, who will struggle three for the liberation of the national productive forces and their reconstitution on the basis of socialist economic theory and practice, who will struggle for the development of a national culture that can yeah. guide and define the identity of all Azanians, irrespective of race and gender. The organizations of the oppressed must come clean on the questions of the struggle against imperialism, against capitalism, against racism, and against sexism. These systems have done enough damage to the economies and the cultures of the countries of the third world for us to bracket them or postpone them to a later period. The question of the transfer of political power from a racial minority to a national majority is one that must be put clearly and squarely first and foremost to our people. Remember that our obligation is primarily to the oppressed people. There must be no question as to what we mean here. Group rights or minority rights are out of the question. They are based on racist thinking and they seek to preserve the privileges of a white minority. The democratic location of political power in the hands of a majority in a single nation under a single, under a single national constitution voted for on the basis of one person, one vote, is what we have in mind and the only thing that we have in mind. No negotiation, therefore, is possible without the total transfer of political power from a racial minority to a national majority. The struggle must, therefore, be intensified until the minority regime resigns and a situation is created where a democratic transfer of political power for the majority can take place. I have raised the land question several times in this address. Its significance cannot be underestimated. In concrete historical terms, the oppression and exploitation of black people in South Africa cannot be properly understood without reference, reference to the issue of possession, 
control and occupancy of the land. The working class condition of black people is premised on their separation from control and occupancy of the land. Behind the cultural co-optation and even Christianization of black people lies their displacement from the land. The abhorrent migrant labor system that produces the super profits in our country, for the countries of, for the international country, is a function of the landlessness of black people.